Hi, and welcome to this EMTPRV webinar, Studies from A to Z. My name is Henry, and I will demonstrate how to use the Transcend software EMTPRV version 3.0 to conduct a capacitor bank switching study. During the demonstration, I will show you how to create an accurate model of line which is frequency dependent, how to build a Tevna equivalent of a network starting with the short circuit currents and power, how to create the pre-insertion resistance and a switching surge arrester, how to model transformers and machine, how to represent the mechanical behavior of a breaker, and finally, how to do a back-to-back -back capacitor bank switching study. But before that, let me introduce EMTPRV to the one of you that are non-users. First, few words about PowerSys. We are the company that commercialize EMTPRV and mainly deal with the following points. The business development, the sales management, the pre-sales and after-sales front office support, the training, the technical support and the development. We also offer some engineering services for the simulation on this slide, the voltage regulation, the power transfer capacity, the voltage stability, the fault recovery, the switching, the, the short circuit, the lightning and harmonics. Please contact us if interesting at sales at powersysolution.com. Here are where we are located around the world. So now let's talk about EMTPRV itself. So EMTPRV is a transient software. What is a transient software exactly? It's a, a transient software is start with the same equation as uh, a stability package. For example, for the an inductance, it will be the voltage. It's equal to the derivative of the flux. But instead of going to the Laplace world, the a transient software will integrate this equation step by step because one of the assumptions in Laplace is that the model is valid only for the fundamental frequency whereas for a transient software you don't do any assumption of course the number of time steps have to be smaller than a frequency <coughs> than in a frequency domain so here are the uh, main kinds of simulation we can use EMTPRV for. Let's start with the network solution, for example. In this study, the input would be, <coughs> excuse me, all the power constraints of a network. For example, the load, which can be PV or PQ, the machine that can produce as well, uh, that the production can be set as a power for a certain voltage, PV or PQ, and the slack bus. Knowing all these constraints on your network, the software runs a load flow simulation and find in the end the voltage everywhere on the network, the angle of the voltage, the power, the current, etc. So it's not known. Uh, EMTPRV is, is, uh, is more known for having a transient, to being a transient software, but the lo its load flow capabilities are actually uh, huge. It, they can be unbalanced. Uh, we stay in the phase, so it can be multi-phase or single phase, and it's actually more and more used uh, in the in the distribution in distribution companies just for its, its uh, load flow capabilities. So then we can do a classic short circuit study, but since it's a transient software, you have access to the transient current and the waveform of the steady state current as well, where you can see the DC component and the high frequency content. Then we do some insulation coordination in case of lightning, for example, or all type of switching, the capacitor bank switching, uh, the, the, the TOV, TRV, etc. Fair resonance can be studied as well. A lot of customers use EMTP for fair resonance, where you can change a lot of initial condition, like the, the flux, the initial flux in the transformer, and, uh, and, and study like that all kind of influence. Then we do also more, more powerful study. For example, in the grid converter or the renewable energy that are power electronics. So in that case, we study every single switching cell with the saturation in the IGBT, the control, uh, the protection. 
So it gets a very big model and it, it's actually extremely precise to simulate a, a network like that. And that's what now the, for all the renewable energy or the power electronics, um, the only approach that is very valid uh, it's with a transient software. Also, since we have access to the, the waveform that are supposed to be the same as in the grid, it makes it possible to study the power, like the power quality. So for that, we have some tool to calculate the Hermes value, uh, the harmonics, the THD, and all kind of power quality indicators. And it, it makes it very precise because all the saturation in the network are, are considered. Also, we can do some transient stability. For that, uh, we have a library of AVR and the governor. And it's in the end, instead of running a simulation of less than a second, you will run a simulation of few seconds or minutes to study the reaction of the control. Finally, <coughs> something new in the software that will be released this year, the protection tool. In the MTP, we are convinced that transient software are the most powerful software to study protection because we can reproduce the saturation in the CVT, the furzonance uh, the, the array of the CVT, the saturation in the CT, and then in the relay model, we'll be able to reproduce each step, the burden resistance of the relay, then the anti-alias filter, uh, the sampling, the DFT to extract the phaser, and then we reproduce all the logic from the manufacturer uh, instruction manual uh, to make it very close to the reality. So this tool will be available uh, this year. So in the end, if you open the software and you go in the simulation options, that's the type of simulation you have. The load flow, we talked about this one. The steady state, which is also a static study, but here we consider all the frequency uh, model of the device. So the Laplace model. And we will solve the network uh, for all frequency present in it and then superpose superimpose the result together. Then we have the time domain simulation, which is the one used for transient, integrated step by step. Then we have two other kind of simulation, very convenient. The first one is the frequency scan. So we use such a study, for example, if, um, if you want to study the connection of a power plant to a network, and you know this power plant might inject some harmonic, then you do a frequency scan at the point of connection to identify all the natural frequency of the network. So in the end, the output of the study is the magnitude of the impedance and the angle of the impedance for a large range of frequencies at the point of connection. And you identify like that the pole and the zero. And you make sure the harmonic injected are not close to one of them. The last one, the statistical study, it is, you, it is used to, uh, to reproduce the mechanical behavior of a breaker. Since a breaker is a mechanical device, it cannot open and close instantaneously. And there is actually a difference between the, theory to, theoretical, the theoretical sorry, closing time and the real closing time because of the mechanical behavior. So for that, the manufacturer um, provides some statistical law that that can uh, conduct the behavior of the breaker for the closing or the opening around the mean value. So in the MTPRV, what we do is we, we have in the input, we can see the mean time, the mean closing time, and the statistical law that detect the behavior of the breaker. Then we're gonna run a lot of simulation. It can be hundreds or 500 simulation. And between each simulation, the switching time of each pole of the breaker will change a little bit following the statistical law. And you can identify like that the worst over voltage and uh, make sure to, uh, to design the coordination, uh, the insulation uh, coordination properly. Here are the range of uh, frequency we can study with the MTPRV. It's in the end all the frequency that are present in the network. Let's start with the high frequency, like the lightning, for example, or the switching transient. For such frequency, the parameters of, uh, of the line and the cable, for example, 
change. They are not the, the, they are not the same anymore that at the fundamental. For example, because of the skin effect, the, the value of the resistance will increase. Same still, the inductance, the value of the inductance will change as well with the frequency. So in the MTPRV, we have some frequency dependent model of line to reproduce that. With this model, the parameter change during the time domain simulation with the frequency. They are very powerful model. Also, this model reproduces the propagation of the waveform through the line. Let's take, for example, a line of 200 km. If you energize the line at the end, nothing will happen at the other end. When the energization is done, there's going to be a waveform that travels through the line reflect at the end and come back. And they're going to be like that, a back and forth of the waveform that's going to be damped eventually by the resistance. So in the MTPRV, we can reproduce all that with the model of line. And actually, this behavior is, has a, a big influence in the over voltage. So we can also simulate slowly a phenomenon, like I talked about the temporary already, but also the DC. Uh, in case of HVDC or uh, wind turbine, for example. So when you buy MTPRV, in the end, that's what you get. The computational engine that runs the, the calculation, the graphical user interface, where you can build the network, put the devices together, connect them, uh, enter the data in the mask. To open the mask of a device, you just double click on, uh, on it. And then you have ScopeView. ScopeView is a tool to uh, display the, the waveform or to do some post-processing, like you can put in PU, in RMS, uh, do so, uh, uh, use uh, FFT to identify the harmonics, study the power quality, etc. We also have another tool to study, to uh, look at the waveform. It's mplot, which is very convenient uh, for statistical study, for example. So here are the benefits of EMTPRV compared to other transient software. First, it's a very robust simulation engine in terms of the way it solves the iteration, the, the sorry, the non-linearity. So for that, we do some iteration um, to find where we are on the curve in case where you have IGBT, which are non-linear, uh, or, or some surge arrestor, or the, all kind of saturation. We do iteration to find exactly where we're on the curve within a time step. Also, we use sparse matrix to solve the network. That makes a big difference as soon as you have uh, an, a large network. Because the length of the simulation, so the simulation time, and the memory usage to run the simulation increase as an exponent 3 of the size of the network. And so you are very limited if you don't use sparse matrix uh, as soon as you have a big network. Also, we have an automatic initialization of the time domain simulation. That's very convenient because most of the time for the machine, for example, or even uh, Slack, you have the information of the power, the voltage, uh, the, angle of the, 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 the angle of the voltage, for example, for the Slack. But you have no idea what is the, um, the angle of the rotor at t equals zero to initialize your network. So in the MTP, you set all the power constraints, you run the load flow, and then during the steady state solution, the, the power angle of, the, of each machine on the network is initialized. So the position at t equals zero is found. Also, the voltage to apply on the field of the, of the machine is calculated as well. So it makes it very easy uh, to just start the simulation and everything is initialized. There is no initial transient. Also, the MTPRV is very convenient to customize and script. All the graphical user interface is based on JavaScript. And so you can write the script that change all kind of scenario uh, exclude or include device, add some device, replace them. Uh, you can do parametric study while you run a simulation, save the result, change, uh, change the parameters, run the simulation again, and do like that parametric study. Also, you can create your own device, so you can write a code. Uh, you have access to function that 
call the inputs and set the outputs of the model and you can integrate your model in the network. You can also import a model from Simulink, for example, or for ETAP. So when you open the NTPRV, that's what you do. First, you create a new blank case, for example. You drag and drop the uh, device from the library. You put them together and enter the data. Then with this network, you can run all types of simulation. For the first two, the multi-phase load flow and the steady state, the result comes out in two ways. It can be as a tab, where you have the name of every node, buses, um, devices with the voltage, the, the, the phase of the voltage, the, the power, reactive power, the current. So it's a, it can be a very large tabs in, tab in the end. The second option is to display directly the result on the graphical user interface. So that is way more convenient and uh, easy to visualize. Then for the time domain simulation, obviously we cannot save every single signal. The memory usage would be terrible. So for that, you have to set scope before running the simulation. For that two option, you can double click, double click on a device and there is a tab named scope where you have a list of signal that you can choose to scope. Or we have a meter library where you can find voltage scope, current scope, sequence, uh, voltage or current scope, power, etc. And you can connect directly this scope on the, on, the net, on the design like you would do on your network directly. It's really a software in the loop. Also, I talked about those advanced model of line Obviously, not every user is supposed to know how to set them. So that's why in the MTP, we have some devices that help you to create the model. Let's take the example of the line. If you go in the line library, you're going to have the frequency dependent model of line, and you're going to have a device named line data. In this device line data, you're going to enter all the data commonly provided by the manufacturer. The example of a line, it will be the number of conductors per phase, uh, the size of the conductor, the DC resistance, the length of the line, and then automatically in this tool you're going to generate the file. The file will be saved by default at the same location of the design. Then you just have to go in the frequency dependent model of line and you have an option to load the file and then your, your model is all set. So we use such an approach for the frequency dependent model for the line uh, the wideband model for the cable, uh, the surge arrester, and some advanced model of transformer like the BC train, for example. Here are a list of references that use EMTPRD. So now I'm going to open EMTPRD and, de and demonstrate the study of today. So let me switch now to EMTPRD. So here are the network, you, we're going to study the capacitor bank switching on. So the capacitor bank itself, it's here, it's a sub-circuit. It's now excluded, but I can still get inside. See, so you have the pin here and, uh, and the capacitor bank here. If you want to learn how to uh, do a sub-circuit, you can go in the file, help and support, and open the tutorial and reference where the there is a tutorial about how to create a sub-circuit. So now let me introduce you how to build the devices present in this network. So first, let's start with uh, the slack bus, the Tevna equivalent. So anytime we do a transient simulation, we have to put a scope so to limit the network. And uh, the limit after that, the rest of the network we don't model, we uh, represent it as a Tevna equivalent. So to build this Tevna equivalent, you have to get, have the short circuit uh, power three phase and one phase. And you can uh, calculate the impedance with the equation here, demonstrated here. So then the slack, the slack you find here, you can find it in the library sources, AC voltage source and impedance. You can drag and drop. If you open it, you have a tab where you can enter the um, where you can enter the parameters. 
So that's to find the, uh, the impedance here. To find the voltage, it's usually you represent the network as a slack. So that means you have a reference of the voltage. So to set this constraint, and that's the case when you want to set the power constraint for the load flow in EMTP, you go again in the library sources and you take a load flow bus like this one. And you, you have to connect it at the terminal of the Tevna equivalent. Then when you open it, you select the type slack bus, you enter the, uh, the voltage, and you have to link this bus, this constraint, with the, the, the Tevna equivalent. Here, the name of it is slack. So you can find it here, slack. Same thing inside here, you have to, to link it. The name of the, the load flow is also slack, but they don't have to have the same name. Here, it's a, it's a coincidence. So we link it as well. Then you don't, you, it doesn't matter anymore of all these results. They will be calculated automatically. Here it has been do, done already. But it will be calculated automatically after the load flow simulation. And that is, in the end, the voltage at this side of the, imped, the, the uh, impedance to, uh, to respect the load flow. Then here we have some transformer. So the transformer are from the library transformer. They, have the, they are the three winding here. Depending on the connection, you have a few options. If we go inside, we double click. That's the information you have to provide. You can have also, you can add the magnetization branch for the saturation. Uh, it's in PU, so it gives some default value. And you have the tab scope. Here, uh, we, are, we are in steady state, so it's not valid yet. But uh, when you do the time domain simulation, you can choose the scope. Anytime, also, for every device, you have a tab help where you can find information about this particular device. So then we have, uh, here we have a, a two winding transformer. So it's the three phase nameplate. You can choose what type of connection and the typical data as well. We have several synchronous machines in this device, is this design. Uh, they are actually put inside the sub-circuit. So here it is. The synchronous machine, you can find them in the library machines, synchronous machine. So then you have few options if you go inside. So first you can link it to a load flow constraint again. Let's say the machine, most of the time, the synchronous machine, their constraints are, are PV constraints. So the, the power in the, in the normal operation at the certain voltage. Here, the, the constraint has been added the same way as before from the library sources, load flow bus. And here, the, the constraint is this power at this voltage. So you can link this machine with this uh, SM bus 11. That's the name of the constraint. Then you can put all the typical information, the elect electrical data. You have a lot of options. Uh, depending on what you have. Most of the time, the manufacturer provides the open circuit test data, but you have a few options. You have the mechanical, you can choose what type of control you have, and the output. Again, uh, help is available. The load flow constraint itself, connected at the, um, at the terminal. So this time, instead of being a slack, it's a PV control. So you give the magnitude of the voltage and the power, you can add a phase if you know it's just a help for the software to converge. It will be a starting point. And you can set limit for the reactive power. But the most important is to link this load flow constraint with the machine. Here also, there is an ADR. Uh, we can go inside of it. So all that is from the library uh, um, Control, uh, control function, no, sorry, from the library, uh, machine controls, you have all the exciter and the governor. And actually, this list will be even longer in the next uh, release of EMTP. We have a lot, lot of new model coming. So then what we have here some line. So here we have a constant parameter of line. They are easy to set. You just have to provide the resistance, inductance, and capacitance for the fundamental frequency and the length, obviously. 
Those lines are not frequency dependent, so they reproduce the propagation of the waveform, but they are not frequency dependent. Here you have an example of a frequency dependent model of line. So let's, uh, I'll show you quickly how to build it. So if you go in the library line, you have to bring the line data device. Then when you open it, you create a new case if it's a new case. And then you have to fill all these uh, all this information. So the number of conductor per phase, the DC resistance, the number of wire, the DC resistance, uh, the size of the conductor, the uh, geometric organization, horizontal, vertical, and the way the vertical uh, eighth at mid span. If you don't have this information, you can put the same value as the vertical eighth and it will be calculated automatically. Also, you, you can put phase numbers. So here, uh, 1, 2, and 3 are the phase 1, uh, A, B, and C. 0 are uh, the ground. So if you put 0, then in the drawing after the device, you will not have access to those phases. If you put 4, for example, then you have access to the neutral, and you can apply a lightning strike, for example. Then you select the model. So for the line, I advise you to take the frequency dependent. For the cable, I advise you the wideband. And then the length of the line and the ground return. The ground return is usually hard to find. A typical value is between 100 and 300. So then you just have to go to uh, save, save and Run, give a name to the path. And uh, when you click OK, automatically a file is three files are generated. Um, at this link, so it's the same place where the device is uh, where the device is uh, is built. So there is a dot out which gives a lot of information on the model, and the dot pun which is the actual model. So then you just have to go in the frequency dependent model of line and select the dot pun, and your model is done. It's very easy. So then here we can see we have a three-phase load from the library load model. It's the PQ load with load flow. We have also a single-phase version, like here, for example, we unbalance, we unbalance the system. So how do we do that to extract the phase? You first have to draw a three-phase bus. And you can then extract the phase A, for example. And you can connect a load only to the phase A, or you can connect it directly to the load. So to draw, to draw like that a wire, you click on the pin, and you release where you want to stop it, and it turns directly into a three-phase automatically. Okay. So I think it's good for the presentation. Um, so now we can run we can run a load flow simulation, uh, for example, which can be interesting is to do it without the capacitor bank and then with the capacitor bank and see the voltage on the bus one. So to display the voltage, uh, remember uh, you have two options: you can display as a tab, or you can display directly on the graphical user interface. I will show you both. So for the second option, you have to go in the library options, and to take a block named view steady state and to bring it in your device in your design then you can you double click on it and you can select your option so here we want to look at the result of the load flow and also we will show uh, the power through the device you can set a base for that so then to display the voltage at the bus you right click on it and you go in signal parameters and you can select whatever you want to see so let's stick here with the positive sequence voltage. You can set a number of digits and a base. Here it's a 230 kV system. So the, this, the results are displayed here because I ran a simulation before, but I will do it again. So we can have a look also at the power of this line. So for that, I go in steady state view, and you can display power, PK, PM, K, 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 M. K is the, pin, the positive pin, M is the negative pin. 
So then to run the load flow simulation here, the, the, the capacitor bank is excluded. You go on simulate, simulation option, and you select find load flow solution. Then you run the simulation. This type of simulation is usually very fast. So we can see here without the capacitor bank, the voltage is 0.96 PU. So that's not enough. Here is the power in megawatt through the line. So now I can include the, this capacitor bank and run the same simulation. And now I have one PU. So that's, uh, that's exactly what we want. The capacitor bank is well designed. So previously, before, the, uh, before, uh, before engineers start using transient software, that was it for uh, simulation of capacitor bank. But the transient is very important as well. And I think now we are all convinced that with the, uh, in the frequency domain, you cannot study the transient, really. So now uh, let's study the, um, the, what happens when we connect the capacitor bank. So this time, instead of having the capacitor bank here closed in steady state, I'm going to connect it at 20 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, sorry. So here what we have, we have the breaker that's going to close at 40 milliseconds, a, a small model of cable, which is just a RL, and then the capacitor bank itself. So I, I, I disconnected here in steady state the capacitor bank, so you have to run the new, um, the new load flow. And so then you just run a time domain simulation. So for that, you uncheck the load flow, you select uh, steady sta find steady state solution and start from steady state and start steady state solution from load flow simulation. Then you can set here the, uh, the simulation type and the time step. Five microseconds, it's a good time step for, capac for capacitor bank switching. So before running the time domain simulation, you have to, uh, to set, to, to, to look what you want to, to see, what signal you want to see. So here, if I double click on the, um, the capacitor bank, I go in scope, the voltage and the current are uh, scoped already. Also, I would like to see the voltage in PU, which is more convenient in the end uh, for insulation coordination. So for that, I go in the library meter. We have the all kind of meter, for example, the voltage scope. It's the voltage to the ground um, as a scope. But here I want to transform it in PU. So I'm going to take voltage three phase function of the time. In that case, oh, I'm going to connect it here. In that case, I have the input of the voltage as a control and the output is actually in the control and I can then uh, do some calculation on it. So here I will add a loss to divide it. Okay, and I'm gonna divide, divide by the base, which is 230 kV, but we have to put it in uh, line to ground and in craft value because we have access to the waveform. And we can put a scope at the end of that. Then I can copy and paste for the other phase. And give name that will help me to remember what it is. So this one could be, for example, VAPU. And this one will be VBPU. This one will be VCPU. Okay, so now I want to uh, switch the capacitor bank at 40 milliseconds. Let's run the base case. So it will be an ideal switch that close at 40 milliseconds. Uh, we don't consider any mechanical behavior. It's, it's just a base case uh, to have an idea of what happened. So then I run the time domain simulation. So you can see it's running here. It's pretty fast. So first, let's look at the result with scope view. So you can op you open scope view, you just go in the tab simulate, simulate and you click on scope view. Scope view sh show up here. So in the signal type, you have all type of signal available. 
So it's where previously I put some scope. Um, to look at the voltage in PU, I put a control scope. Uh, the, the loss, we can see here it's in the library control. And here they are, VA, PU, PU VBPU, and it's in the sub-circuit CBUS1. So I click once on them, they appear here, and then I plot them. I can su superimpose them for better visualization. I select them and I click here. And so we can see in that case, let me zoom. In that case, the worst over voltage is about the maximum. It's 1.3 PU. So now let's try to reproduce the mechanical behavior of, um, of the breaker. So for that, as I explained, we have to run a statistical study. First, here I specify that the, we close the breaker at, f at 40 milliseconds. But in the end, if the process of closing the switch has, is not synchronized with the network, then uh, you have to, uh, that can happen any time on a period. So you have to uh, add a statistical law, which is uh, that mean, which mean this event can happen any time during uh, during the, the the 60 hertz period, right? Here, arbitrarily in the Slack, I said that we started at uh, 13 of the angle for the voltage, but it could have been something else. So I have to add this uh, linear statistical of two periods. Also, in the breaker has uh, a sparse in closing because of the mechanical behavior, so I have to reproduce those two phenomena. So to run the statistical study, first you have to go in the option and take the uh, statistical option as well as mplot. mplot is the tool we use to watch the results of uh, statistical. So then you double click on the statistical and use the study type you choose statistical. I'll go fast on that. So uh, for the time of dice roll, you, you, you should keep computer defined. Uh, if you want more information on what it is, you can uh, look at the help. The number of simulation, uh, the more you put, the more precise you are. But here uh, we, have we are limited in time, so I'll do only 15 of them. Then you can uh, choose what how do you select the random number? Here it will be random and find a, a multiple, uh, a maximum multiple of standard deviation. This is used to uh, calculate the time of dice roll. So then that's the, um, the delay, uh, the, the statistical law for having a random event happening sometime in the, uh, in the period. So here we are doing a closing time, and it can happen at any time during one period. Then for the output, any time we want to save uh, the mean and max time points, and the mean and max for every value. You have the option to save every waveform, but I don't really recommend it because it can be, uh, it, the memory usage will explode. Okay, so then you set the, the, simula the statistical option are set. Then we just have to enter the data for uh, the breaker. So for that, we go inside in the breaker model and there's a, type, a tab named random data. And we set it as Gaussian for each, uh, for each pole of the breaker. So we'll talk after what is the dependency here. There is no dependency, so it's master. We work on the closing time and we will close at 40 milliseconds, like the same as the base case. The standard deviation, here is a typical value for a SF6. Uh, we can also put this one, it's also typical. Let's do that for the three phase. 40 milliseconds.
and so also for the scope I'm gonna scope uh, all the real time all the real switching time so now what the software is gonna do first during for each simulation it will uh, determine the switching time of each uh, of each ball uh, sometime in the waveform and then save this result, the maximum and the minimum, and run the other. So see now, if I run the simulation, automatically all these simulations start. You can see the simulation number here and the simulation going. So that can be time consuming, but it's the most precise way to do. And that's way now uh, having sparse matrix makes a lot of sense because uh, you can save a lot of time now. So let's wait the end of the 50 simulation. It will take less than one minute. And then we're gonna have a look at all the over voltage, uh, the statistical worst case scenario. Uh, and we'll also be able to reproduce then this scenario. Twenty more. Now 10 more simulation. The typical value for the number of simulation we set is 500. In that case, you have a, a very good uh, idea of what's going to happen. Here again, I choose only 50 for the purpose of, because we are limited in time. Okay, so now all the simulation have been done. So I open mplot and I choose to display the statistical simulation data. So let's look at the, P, the uh, worst over voltage at the point. So we go again in the control and it will be, again, we find here the APU, uh, VBPU, VCPU. Keep in mind that here you have the minimum and the maximum, but we are in an AC current. So the, the value can be negative or uh, positive. So you have to choose both. We have for that an option that select directly the minimum and the maximum. Okay, so we're going to start by uh, displaying all the, the maximum of those uh, three voltage. And we can see it here. See, it's pretty interesting. For the base case, when the switch closed exactly at 4 milliseconds, the worst over voltage was about 1.3. But here we can see we have, we have one which is way higher than that. Let's zoom on it. It goes more than 1.7. That's a very bad over voltage. It result of all the propagation of the waveform that back that, that are back and forth. And uh, if this event up occurs at the worst time in the waveform, resulting of all those uh, all those scenario, you can find this worst over voltage. So after we're gonna run this particular case, the number twenty one, and see what happens. So as a convenient tool we have uh, here with Scope View, um, you can plot, for example, the common cumulative distribution function. So it reflects the uh, probability to have a certain level of voltage. Uh, for example, here, if we use the, uh, the X hair, I go there, I have 98% uh, of chance to have a vol an over voltage under of 1.61 PU. So that, that gives a good idea um, of, uh, of the percentage of chance to have a failure. Also, you have the mean value, uh, the mean and the max. So that's a, a very good indication for the, uh, the, sweet, the, the over voltage study. You can also plot uh, an histogram. So now let's reproduce the worst case scenario. So for that, you have to go in the scope type and select the real uh, time of switching for the switch SW2. So what we have to do is we have to save those uh, those switching time. So for that, you're going to save random data for devices. So you, you select 
where you want to save that. So I'm going to put it at the same location of my device, of my design, sorry. Oops, sorry about that. So you have to name it. So let's name it like this one, for example, demo case uh, that uh, a point dot. You have to write yourself the name of the extension. Then when you save, yeah, you're going to replace it. You choose what, where, what simulation uh, number you want to perform. So in my case, it was the 21, the worst case. Anytime you're going to run a new statistical uh, simulation, the worst case will change. Okay, so now to be able to run this worst case scenario, we're going to take in the option the um, fixed random data. So you click on name and you uh, remove the disable and we're going to select the data file we just created. So now what it's going to do is it's going to run the base case but putting the switching time f that have been found for the worst case scenario for the base case. So then you can run this simulation. So this time it doesn't do the uh, load flow simulation. Uh, it doesn't do, sorry, the statistical case because we use the fixed, and rem the fixed uh, random data. So let's compare what we found with what we had at the beginning. So I'm going to do a snapshot of those curves. That's the one we had initially. And I'm going to plot the new curve on it. So see, the switching time this time happen, uh, occurs way after, right? Because we put that uh, the option to have this event that can happen randomly during the period. And we can see the over voltage here. That is way worse. Let's zoom on it. That's the, the over voltage. Let's, let's now have a look only at the, the new voltage. So I, I uncheck the show curves. So here, are the, here is the worst case scenario. So now you can do all type of uh, study on that. Look at the over voltage of each phase. Also the rate of increase of the voltage. See, it's pretty bad at the beginning. So you have some risk of pre-strike. If you want to see the rate of increase of this curve, you can use the, the double data cursor. Click here and here. And so you have, um, you have the slope here. And so you, you can make sure you have no pre-strike during the closing. Just to let you know, it's possible to model the pre-strike in the MTPRV also. So a common way to deal with the over voltage uh, following a capacitor bank switching is to add a pre-insertion resistance, for example. So let's add a pre-insertion resistance in that case. So we can uh, copy and paste this breaker and add the pre-insertion resistance. Let's put a value of 100 ohm. And what we can do is uh, set, so now what, we, what we're going to do, we're going to do again the statistical study, but with the, the, um, with the pre insertion resistance. So what's going to happen is the pre insertion resistance will close at 30 milliseconds, and 10 milliseconds after, the uh, main breaker will close. So the main breaker, the switching time of the main breaker will depend on the switching time of the, the uh, pre-insertion resistance. And so that's why we're going to have a dependency here in the, uh, in the statistical, um, in the statistical uh, simulation. The pre-insertion switch will be uh, the main, the master, and the SW2 will be the slave. But first, let's run, uh, let's run the base case scenario. So for that, I'm going to disable 
I'm going to disable the fixed random data and disable the statistical analysis option. So now I run the simulation. I will run the base case for the, the new uh, configuration. Okay, so let me remove the memory. Okay, so that's the new base case, excuse me. That's the new base case with uh, the pre-insertion resistance. Oh, sorry, I forgot to, uh, to change the value of the resistance. It was 100. Okay, so let's run this case again. Yeah, the over voltage wasn't that low this time. So that's why I was like, I, I knew there was a problem. Here we go. So now the worst over voltage for the base case is here. It's about uh, 1.6. Let's look at it. The maximum value is 1.15, so it's pretty good. So to make sure that with the, the, this resistance, the, the pre-insertion resistance is well designed, we have to do a statistical study again uh, for the same reason as before. You, here we, we switch as a particular time in the period, but it, this is random if we have no synchronization. So we have to put a random low, a linear random low on a, on a period, and also the mechanical behavior of the switch as an influence again. So let's bring back our statistical uh, analysis option. And now let's set, so the switch, the, the SW1 will be the master. It's the master and it's gonna close at 30 milliseconds. Also, usually those are more accurate than uh, the, the, the main breaker. So the SW2 will be uh, the slave. So you have to put the reference of the switch. So here, the, the master will be SW1 phase A for the phase A. And it's going to close 10 milliseconds after. Same thing for the other phase. Okay, so let's run now this new, uh, let's run this new statistical uh, study to identify, oh, I have an error here. What is the error? Oh, I uh, didn't read it right. So let's run again this statistical uh, simulation, this time with the pre-insertion resistance. And we'll, make, we'll be sure uh, we'll be sure that the pre-insertion resistance is designed properly and we can switch the capacitor bank at any time. So again, we have to wait for the 50, um, for the 50, um, for the 50 simulation. So this case, uh, it's, a, it's a good solution, the pre-insertion resistance. The only problem with that is if, um, if we do a multiple uh, switching on the, on the capacitor bank, you can have trap charge on it. And in that case, uh, if you have trap charge, the, the pre-insertion resistance will not be enough to prevent the overvoltage. So in, that's the case we're going to study after. We're going to see how to create a surge arrestor and how to connect a surge arrestor uh, instead of the uh, pre-insertion resistance. So the trap charge can be studied on the capacitor bank, but also on a cable or on a line uh, in the end in every uh, device that has a capacitance effect. Okay, so first let's look at the results in that, in that case. We open mplot again, and we look at the control the same as before.
So see, it's way better than it now. It's concentrate less than 1.2 PU, so it's a big, very good over voltage. Uh, we can again look at the uh, common cumulative distribution function. And so now we have, if I plot here, we have 98% of chance to have an over voltage lower than 1.2 PU. So that's a very good simulation. So now let's study uh, the effect of the trap, the trap charge. So this time I'm going to remove the new pre-insertion resistance. There you go. So I use the zap for that. And we're going to close this switch in steady state. So disable all the um, statistical case. Okay. So what we're going to do now, the, this, switch, this breaker is going to be closed in steady state. Uh, but at a point, we're going to open it. So as soon as you open the breaker, you disconnect uh, the, um, the capacitor bank. There's going to be a trap charge. And then we're going to reconnect it again. Okay, so we put a second breaker here. So this, so we connect it in parallel to uh, to uh, to reproduce the reclose. Okay, so we open this one, for example, at 40 milliseconds again, and we're going to close this one at uh, 100 milliseconds. It doesn't matter really because we'll be in steady state. Okay, so let's run the base case and see what happened here. Oh, we have to uh, run the load flow again because now it's connected in steady state. The, the capacitor bank is now connected in steady state, so we have to run the load flow with that. Good. Um, yeah, this breaker is not supposed to, it closed, sorry, I did a mistake. It closed at one, 100 millisecond, and it open, uh, never open. But it doesn't change anything for the, for the load flow. That was the, the, the error I had was that I have two switch closed in parallel. It's never good. Okay, so let's run the base case now. So I remember what happened. We are closed initially. We're going to open switch two. Uh, we're going to have a trap charge, then we're going to close switch 3, and uh, we're going to have an over voltage because of that. Okay, so let's have a look. So see, this time the over voltage is pretty bad, for the, even for the base case. Uh, we are at 1.85 uh, uh, PU. Uh, so yeah, it's a very bad over voltage. So let's try to do the statistical case now. So, um, so I, I have to enable it first. Statistical. Okay, so for the first one, it doesn't really matter really. As you can see here, when we open, we are in steady state after. Um, the breaker always have to open, uh, to a, the, has to wait for a zero crossing of the current to open. Right, the breaker cannot cut the current. So whenever you ask the breaker to, to um, whenever you ask the breaker to open, it will always be at the zero voltage because that's the time for a capacitor bank that the current is zero. So see here, I put a random time at 40 here, but the opening time is actually after at the first zero crossing of each phase. So whatever scenario you do, you're going to have this trap charge. So no need to do any statistical here; it will be the same result. We will only do the statistical for the second breaker, the closing time, that will have an influence. So I'm going to disable the statistical for the first one. And going to enable here, so the closing time this time will be 120 and we are a master. One twenty, and the same thing here. Okay. So 
So let's run this statistical again. So we go again for 50 simulations. So this time, uh, re I remember again what we do. We have this breaker that open at 40. We have a trap charge on the breaker. Uh, the same kind of simulation can be done with the cable or the line. Cables and line also have trap charge when you disconnect them. Then we're going to reconnect the um, we're going to reconnect the capacitor bank, and this time we're going to have a way bigger overvoltage. So in that case, the pre-insertion resistance cannot help really. So the best solution for that is to use a uh, surge arrestor. So I'm going to show you right after how to um, how to create a surge arrestor and to look some uh, useful to look at some useful parameters. Okay, so let's open mplot and look at again the same voltage as before Oop. Sorry, the max power so see now the, the worst case is pretty bad right if we zoom on that we reach to uh, we reach uh, more than 2.5 almost 2.5 pu it's the six the number six Okay, let's have a look at uh, the common distributed uh, function. Uh, see, now we have we have 98% of chance to have two uh, less than 2.23 PU, and in the end, if we got 50 here, we have 50% of chance to have more than 180 1.8 uh, PU. So it's really a non-acceptable solution. Okay, so uh, let's add now a surge arrestor. So to create a surge arrestor, you have to go in the library, nonlinear. So the surge arrestor is uh, this device, and first you have to bring the data data function, which have been done here. To create your model. So let's see inside how, we, how it does. So first you have to put uh, the desired voltage rating. It's usually equal to uh, the MCOV uh, in a line, uh, line to ground in RMS multiplied by a security factor like 1.05 for example. Then when you have uh, the surge arrestor, so sometimes you know the manufacturer they give the curve of a surge arrestor of the same type, which is not exactly the same voltage rating. So here, instead of giving the curve of a uh, surge arrestor of the, the desire, uh, the desire uh, voltage rating, we have uh, the, the, surge, the, the curve for surge arrestor of this voltage here. But the curve is supposed to be the same shape. So what we do is we enter the curve for the, the one we have, and we specify it. And so automatically it will be re squared to fit the good vo the desired voltage rating. So then here you enter the point amp in ampere and voltage for this uh, this model of uh, surge arrestor. You can add some extra multiply multiplier, for example, if you want to put in PU. So then here the software will do uh, an exponential piecewise exponential fitting to recreate the curve. So you can set a minimum value of current uh, for uh, to start the fitting, and below this current, the fitting will just be linear. For the fitting option, uh, select the default. You don't have to really uh, deal with that. So then you can add a gap. So for the uh, Z and O, usually there is no gap. For other kind of uh, of arrestor like the SIC. Uh, Usually they are in series a gap, but here we have no gap. So let's run this case. So you can select a name. Uh, so here I, I rated that name. And it's generated. So now what we have to do is, it's very easy. It's like with the line, you just take your surge arrestor. So you connect, you connect it at the terminal, you ground it. And you just have to load this file. Parafood, oh, it's in French. <laughs> I think you've noticed I am French. Then you just click on load and the model is built. 
So let's run the same statistical uh, simulation, but now with the surge arrester. So the surge arrester, they have a very uh, nonlinear curve, which uh, which will which will which will sorry limit in the end the over voltage at uh, a particular uh, voltage. So we really expect instead of to have a linear curve like that, we're going to have a curve that um, that is vertical at a point to a certain uh, to the certain value of the certain value of over voltage. So let's wait. So then again, uh, any time after, you can uh, run the uh, the worst case scenario, that, like like I've did at the first uh, example. So for that, you just have to plot the the real switching time. You you put you place them here and you go and save, and you save the random data. Don't forget to add the extension uh, point that. And after you just use the fixed random data to run the worst case scenario. Okay, so let's uh, let's plot this new case. So see now it's way better. We don't cross anymore the two PU. Let's compare. That's the one without the surge arrester. That's the one with the surge arrester. See they are all concentrated around 1.5. Let's look at. Um, let's look at now the uh, CCD. Nope, the CCDF. See, so it's what it's what we were expected. It starts to be very vertical around the value. So that's where the uh, the curve of the surge arrester is very nonlinear, almost horizontal, and so it will be always limit in that case. So see, now we have, uh, for example, we have fifty percent of chance to have something higher than 148, but 98% to have below 1.55. Uh, so it's very good. Um, also, um, what you can do is you can plug the energy to the surge arrester. So for that, you go to control. You go to the observe, sorry, and you select the energy. So let's let's for example plot the energy of this one. So uh, what you do, you just take a sco a meter, a control meter, control scope. You click to uh, create a small wire and you write the energy of the surge arrester like that. So it will be E underscore Z N O one. That's the name of the surge arrester and the phase. And you can copy and paste here. Let's do that for the three phase. So here I have B. And C. So I could have done that uh, before. Actually, it would have been more clever to do that before um, the statistical study. Uh, and after I can just plot the, the statistical uh, power, the statistical energy for each simulation. But you know what? Let's just run the worst case scenario, and we'll have a look at that. So to uh, to run this worst case scenario, I bring back these guys. I save them. Bring me there again. Okay, so I find again the, 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 the saving place. Sorry about that. Webinar. Okay. Um, what simulation number was it? I don't remember. Oh, they're all pretty good. Let's let's do this one. The thirty-two. Okay, so let's run this uh, this thirty-two. I enable this one and I select. Oh, where did I put it? Huh. Um, I don't find where. I, oh uh, no, 
Where is it? I think I did a mistake on the path where I save it. Oh well, anyway I can do it again. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to find it again. Okay, so the 32. Sorry for that. Okay, just copy it on this case again. Okay, so this time let's have a look at the energy through the surge arrestor. So I just added this uh, scope, so I have to refresh. It's a new signal, I have to refresh scope view. Uh, control. Um, don't see them. Uh, uh, uh. Start again. No, oh, here it is. I didn't refresh the good one. Okay, I'm going to put them in page two. Here we go, and that's so that's the energy of the phase. Uh, it's very bad for the phase B. That's the energy through the surge arrestor during the worst case scenario. So th that's how you can design uh, your surge arrestor. Once again, a better way to have done that is um, to directly uh, do the statistical study with uh, with those plots here, and to directly after plot like we did here the energy. But that should be the same thing. Okay, so um, maybe let's do quickly um, another uh, 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 last kind of study, back-to-back uh, -back switching capacitance. So you can do the exact same thing we've done for one uh, capacitor bank. We can do for two capacitor banks. So, uh, for example, if I connect this one here. So that's the second one. Um, I'm going to put a breaker. So here I will not do the statistical study because we don't really have time. Uh, but let me just specify this one is closed in steady state. It never open, And we're going to connect the second capacitor bank at 40 milliseconds. Just to have a look at the results. Of the base case, uh, so I'm gonna disable. I'm gonna disable all that, all the statistical options, and let's run this new base case. So this time it would be interesting to have a look at the current through the surge through the the current of the capacitor bank C1. So let's have a look at that. We go in branch current, um, and here it is. Let's put it on page two again. Oh, I put second instead of millisecond. Typical mistake. <laughs> Let me run that again and show you the result. There you go. So see that we have here a very high amplitude and uh, frequency. Let's put them all together actually. See we have here more than, than 10 PU I guess. 
let's let's see what frequency is that roughly it's about 7000 um 7000 uh, hertz so in that case it starts to be important to have frequency dependent model of line because that's pretty fast so why do we have such a high frequency right because here we created a rlc circuit we have in the end two inductance in series so they had to get up and uh, two capacitance in series but the inductance are the one of the cable they are very low so the natural frequency of this network is very high so it makes it, ma it makes sense to have something like that okay so we can have a look it's on page one in the voltage in that case the over voltage is not that bad but the current is bad and so for in here you can have a lot of pre-strike and re recognition so it can be important to study that for the breaker as well okay so uh, I think this is it for the um, this is it for the demonstration of the, the capacitor, uh, the switching capacitance. Um, if you have any question, uh, we're going to stay uh, connected for 15, 20 minutes. So please ask the question. Uh, if you have any technical question, please send or uh, yeah, send us a message um, at sales dot usa at emtp dot com or sell at powersys solution dot com. Uh, any any technical question or if you'd like to request a try license uh, we'll be happy to help you with that if anything hasn't been clear and you want more information or something please contact us uh, it was a pleasure to do the, the this webinar today i hope you enjoy and um, have fun with the mtp bye bye